start by saying that when I saw the title of this panel, Are New Challenges Increasing the New East-West Divide? I thought that it uh, kind of belonged to the old security agenda. Uh, the whole idea of uh, East-West is something that um, I think is part, an integral part, of course, of the Cold War. And generally, in my view, not perhaps relevant as much today as it was at that time. Nevertheless, of course, the old security agenda uh, that goes back many centuries, the agenda that basically concerns political and military security, it is a historic agenda and uh, it is uh, certainly present today. Um, it will not go away. Definitely conflicts, including military conflicts that affect security will uh, continue. Uh, probably we will see hopefully less such conflicts um, um, as the world evolves, but this is an agenda for which the nations of the world, for which the militaries are preparing. But there is also a new security agenda, and uh, it is much more recent. I think it started to emerge uh, probably with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a work in progress. And uh, certainly other things, uh, not just the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but for example, the Third World Development Agenda, the emergence of the environmental movement in the 1960s and the 1970s, the first Earth Summit, for example, and now the pandemic, the pandemic and the problems of health security and biosecurity, biological security, I think are part of this emerging new security agenda. Um, The two security agendas are interrelated and uh, they interact and influence each other. And in some cases they merge as for example, in the problem of the biosecurity, which I will discuss later and also the environment. Uh, it's interesting that President Biden has declared that climate change is a national security priority. And even in remarks to members of the US military, to the US troops in Europe, he said that military leaders told me that climate change represents the greatest threat to America. And this was questioned by some observers, by some analysts in the United States. But I think that it's an interesting development and uh, I, I think that Um, many other countries will probably move in that direction, in the direction of accepting climate change as not just the problem of the environment, but also as a security part of the security agenda. So I think the question is, how do we integrate and reconcile these two agendas? Because as I said, uh, the old security agenda will not go away. Uh, last year, as the pandemic was gaining momentum, uh, the Gorbachev Foundation, the International Foundation for Socioeconomic and Political Studies in Moscow, for which I work, published a report titled Pandemic and the New Thinking, the New Political Thinking. Uh, it was a product of intense Zoom and telephone conversations involving Also personally, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the president of the foundation and a number of analysts and experts. Uh, I would like to discuss here some um, aspects of this report as well as um, some of its conclusions and uh, recommendations. Uh, first of all, about uh, uh, the uh, security Um, agenda as we see it in the context of the new political thinking, 
what is the new political thinking? Well, uh, we believe that uh, one of the best expressions of this new political thinking was Gorbachev's speech in 1988 at the UN uh, General Assembly session. Uh, basically, the main tenet of the new uh, political thinking is that whereas states, nations will continue to have to take care of their security and their national interests, there is a common interest and there is a common uh, goal that unites them all, that should unite them all. And that is that they should recognize that they have common responsibility for the survival of mankind. And uh, the new thinking was proposed as a project to reshape international politics in accordance with some universal human values such as human life, freedom and security for each and every person, not just security for nations. Um, the new political thinking inherited the traditions of the nuclear disarmament movement that emerged after the Second World War, the Russell Einstein Manifesto uh, of 1955, uh, the ideas that were advanced by the Club of Rome, the concept of sustainable development. Uh, the UN speech in 1988 was the first time that this was proposed by a head of state as uh, a new approach to international affairs. While, of course, recognizing the uh, political and military aspects of security, in fact, the common goal and the common responsibility uh, that Gorbachev had in mind uh, when he spoke at the UN was primarily was above all the need to stop the nuclear arms race and to start the process of nuclear arms reduction and ultimately nuclear disarmament. However, of course, we have seen that this common responsibility has now been expanded to a common responsibility for the state of the environment and um, uh, the development of um, uh, third world countries, if they still can be called third world, fighting poverty, uh, and uh, of course now also uh, addressing the problems that we have seen during the pandemic. Um, so uh, in the report, we uh, have mentioned, the report, by the way, was published in June. In the report about pandemic and the new thinking, we have mentioned uh, um, a very important development that we have been seeing over the past decade, probably, but also in particular during the events of the pandemic. And that is the problem of uh, trust. The problem of trust within countries and uh, the uh, problem of trust among nations in uh, relations between states. Um, the problem of trust within nations we've seen, it's, it's trust uh, of large sections of the population, I would say mistrust of large sections of the population toward government, toward the state, toward uh, bureaucracies and the elites. Uh, the problem of trust among nations, well, we have seen that particularly in Europe. Uh, we have seen that uh, after uh, 2014 in particular. Uh, we've seen that also in uh, Brexit. Uh, it's a kind of merging of mistrust within a country, Great Britain, and mistrust, uh, kind of international mistrust, and the rejection of uh, the EU as an international institution. Similarly, Donald Trump's presidency was, I think, also an expression of this rising mistrust. This is what uh, 
the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres diagnosed in uh, 2018 as a bad case of trust deficit disorder. And he said in his address more recently that member states, UN member states uh, struggle or fail to find reasonable common ground on many, many issues. So governments do not trust each other and people are losing uh, trust in uh, governments. Uh, and uh, that means that there, there should be a remedy for this. And uh, one of the remedies, I think, ultimately, is um, the process of greater democracy, more democracy, democratization within state, states and more democratic relations among states. But of course, we fully understand that this is easier said than done. The pandemic crisis has exacerbated existing tensions, it deepened existing tensions. It also, I think, uh, um, um, brought out new tensions and new problems and new conflicts. Uh, we have seen that we're in the midst of a kind of geopolitical shift toward perhaps a confrontation between, in particular, the United States and China as a link uh, between domestic and foreign policies and politics. I think we have seen that this move toward uh, uh, a more conflictual relations between uh, the US and China is also uh, underpinned by uh, certain things happening in the United States domestically. There's been greater tensions towards uh, Asian Americans. China is again uh, represented in, uh, by some American politicians, uh, by former President Trump, by some American media as an enemy. And if this continues, if this evolves into a real bilateral confrontation, this, of course, will pose problems. This will pose problems for many countries, for European countries, for Russia, a new bipolarity that is being exacerbated by the uh, crisis, by the pandemic crisis, uh, is something that has no good scenarios for uh, global politics for other countries. And uh, any scenario of this new bipolarity, of this new bilateral confrontation uh, is unfavorable and therefore uh, uh, entails many risks. Uh, and uh, as I said, will be a problem for the world, for many countries. Uh, we are suggesting in our report that uh, Russia in particular should do its best to avoid uh, taking sides in this confrontation. Uh, by the way, Joseph Borrell, the high representative of the European Union, has said that uh, this increasing confrontation between China and the US is something that could frame tomorrow's world. But he also stressed that uh, European countries don't have to choose between the United States and China, and that the European Union need needed strategic autonomy. Uh, well, but, but Europe's strategic autonomy, I don't think will be a solution to this uh, trend. And I think that efforts should be made in order to perhaps help the United States and China avoid a, a real bipolar uh, confrontation. Now, Another thing that has, I think, uh, become obvious uh, during uh, this pandemic crisis is that we have big gaps in uh, the problem of health security and in addressing the problem of health security and biosecurity. It has highlighted this uh, problem. It has shown that the problem hasn't been resolved uh, globally 
either in its public health dimension or in preventing the military use of the achievements of modern biology. Let me remind you that in uh, 2005, the World Health Organization adopted the international health regulations intended to ensure health security and biosecurity. The purpose of those regulations was to, I quote, prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease. But it is clear over the past uh, year and a half that the, uh, th there's been a malfunction of, of mechanisms provided by the international health regulations. And uh, uh, therefore discussions are needed at the political level and at the expert level on how to make these mechanisms more effective, how to strengthen measures to ensure compliance with them. Uh, we have seen that actually many politicians, many leaders are not even aware of the existence of those international health regulations. Uh, the current crisis has also reminded us that the Convention on the Prohibition of the Development, Production and Stockpiling of Bacteriological and Toxin Weapons and their Destruction that entered into force in 1975 is weakened by the fact that it does not provide for a mechanism of control. There were attempts to create such a mechanism of control led by the United Nations, uh, by the way, by a Hungarian ambassador, a diplomat from Hungary, but unfortunately, uh, uh, those efforts, uh, very good efforts, they failed. By the way, uh, also uh, quite a few countries, signatories to the convention announced reservations uh, concerning certain provisions of the convention. And uh, the critics of the convention note that there is a very vague line between permitted research conducted for the purposes of prevention uh, on the one hand and research that may result in the development of biological weapons. So it is uh, uh, clear, well, for example, uh, the United States has said that um, it has a position against the mechanism of control and verification, uh, and it's against the protocol that would uh, strengthen uh, compliance with the Biological Weapons Convention. But the U.S. believes, as the State Department has uh, uh, stated, that it will not, such a protocol will not strengthen compliance and who could hurt US national security and commercial interests. Uh, so bioterrorism relations, uh, bioterrorism related threats could also be exacerbated by the emergence of uh, the threat of bioterrorism. Various biotechnologies, including synthetic biology, that is designing and creating biological systems with tailor-made attributes and functions that may not exist in, nation, in nature. Uh, this could spread throughout the world and get into the wrong hands. So there are concerns that some biological substances could be used to create an atmosphere of fear, chaos, social tensions. Obviously, these two biosecurity areas are connected. And uh, uh, the problem, again, is the lack of trust primarily between the world's leading powers. And uh, uh, we have seen already the suspicions regarding how the uh, virus, the COVID virus emerged. And uh, there's been some mutual accusations by some representatives of the uh, world's major powers. And uh, of course, if that continues, this, this is a path to a dead end. The only reasonable uh, path today is to ensure real international interaction and cooperation focused on areas that thus far have not received sufficient attention. Uh, so to conclude, I will just say that uh, these uh, global challenges and in particular the recent challenge of the pandemic, I think emphasize that there is a need to 
merge the two agendas, the traditional security agenda and the new security agenda that is becoming more and more relevant that is actually relevant to all uh, countries. Uh, let me just quote uh, from an interview that President Mikhail Gorbachev gave last year, uh, where he reminded uh, of the need to address the challenges that I've said. And that actually reminded uh, the uh, reader of uh, an interesting appeal from the Forum of Nobel Peace Laureates that he uh, presided uh, back in 2005. It's amazing, 2005. Let me quote, uh, focusing on meeting human needs and having a reverence for life are the foundation of human security. Excessive military expenditures actually breed insecurity. Two areas where funds need to be channeled by the international community are education and health, particularly regarding scourges such as AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and that should be done through both protection and prevention. So in that interview, Gorbachev uh, wondered, what could one add to this? Just the name of the new dreadful disease. He added that over the past years, uh, we've been hearing mostly talk about weapons, missiles, airstrike, but is it not clear that wars and arms race cannot solve today's global problems? And so he said, I will never tire of repeating. We need to demilitarize world affairs and political thinking and reallocate funds from military purposes to the purposes serving human security. We need to rethink the concept of security. Above all else, security should mean providing food, water, which is already in short supply, a clean environment, and as a priority, caring for people's health. And let me continue this quote and conclude uh, with uh, what you said uh, that addresses the practical aspect of this. To achieve human security, we need to focus on developing strategies, making preparations, planning and creating reserves. This should be the responsibility of national leaders and leaders at all levels. He also called for starting preparations for an emergency session of the United Nations General Assembly to be held as soon as the situation is stabilized. Obviously, this was last year. He was hoping, as all of us were hoping, that the situation would stabilize uh, perhaps by the end of last year. It still is uh, very difficult, but I think that this appeal is very relevant today, and let's hope that the nations of the world will come together to address these new challenges to their security. Thank you very much.